Welcome, Dr. Otto. Unmute your mic. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you again. Uh, last year we met through uh, our webinar and uh, I'm happy to um, to host you again through our uh, JBCP uh, platform. How's everything? Everything is good, and you? I'm looking forward actually for October. It's around the corner, as, uh, as they say. Right, right. Yeah, it'll get to be very busy at that time. Uh, it's busy already. <laughs> September. Yeah. Busy already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're gonna start uh, in five minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah. That'd be great. Do you know I had this horrible dream last night? It woke me up <laughs> that I missed my lecture. Yeah, and yeah. It was no. yesterday. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I was up for like two hours just <laughs> <laughs> no, you you are you are awake and you're with us now. <laughs> yeah, no. It's like that dream you have. Like yes, about, of course. I uh, like college, like you never went to your yeah. class. And it's finals, and you don't even know where to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember how it felt back then. Yeah. <laughs> I still have those flashbacks, and you know, I never missed a final. I don't even know why I have that anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of weird. Um, yeah, I know how it feels, actually. Yeah, so how's the weather there now? Yeah, you know, it's um, um, it's autumn, so it's starting to get cold. It's usually hot, uh, but it started to get uh, cold. Today it was a bit hot, but um, it's getting better, better than summer. Anything is better than some, summer. Yeah, you know what? I usually I don't like it. <laughs> in summer. I'm just like, I'm out of here. It's hot. <laughs> but we'll be getting... Uh, I'd say, you know, first part of October, it'll start cooling down. So that'll be. Yeah, fun. yeah, yeah. Here uh, here in Jordan, too, in October, the weather is very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same for us. I guess and we'll see you next year in October. I'm hoping, right? Fingers crossed. Well, yeah, yes, you yes. Cross our fingers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you love it here. You love the weather, the the landmarks, the everything, uh, the ruins. We have uh, uh, too many things to see, uh, an ancient history, to uh, stories to tell. So we'd love to see you. Uh, oh, I can hardly wait. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to it. Likewise, <laughs> likewise. <laughs> <laughs> I love history. I just love it. And I just, it just brings it to life when you get to walk it. And um, yeah, you'll get to walk through it here. Right. Yeah. You know, it's uh, in the United States, we think we have some historical buildings that might be, you know, a couple hundred years old. And then you look at the rest of the world and that's really not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's more than a couple of thousands of years ago, you know, right. uh, Roman uh, ruins and even, I, I guess, yeah, the Roman ones are the most uh, uh, ancient ones, I guess. So, yeah. Oh, how fun. I'll escort you. <laughs> I would love that. I would really love that. I'm gra grab grabbing my coffee here. Uh, I'm one of those that can't be without their coffee for very long. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I grabbed my water, actually. <laughs> I should be so healthy. <laughs> uh, coffee is good, by the way. Uh, I think of all the drugs, coffee is probably the safest. <laughs> it's the healthiest one. <laughs> yeah, and it does, it. you know, it increases your brain power. It's supposed to decrease colon cancer, do some other stuff for you. So I can have every excuse in the world to drink it. <laughs> Yeah, coffee advocate. <laughs> now, do you guys drink more tea or coffee? Uh, he, uh, me or? Uh, In uh, Jordan, per se, because oftentimes. Co coffee, coffee addicts. Okay. Uh, everyone, literally everyone is, co is a coffee addict. Oh, good. <laughs> you'll see every kind of coffee and you, you can try it here. You'll, you'll love it. I love it. Great. In every corner, you will find someone who uh, who sells coffee. In every corner, literally. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> so, how's COVID for you? 
Well, actually, things are getting uh, better, you know, uh, because um, life is getting back to normal. Uh, uh, education is back in schools, um, face-to-face learning. Um, uh, all the sectors are uh, almost open. Um, people are co- trying to comply to, you know, the precautions uh, for their own safety. Uh, and you know the uh, the cases are within the acceptable range so far, so uh, life is getting back to normal to some extent. Oh, I'm you know, glad. The traffic actually, actually, <laughs> <laughs> the traffic is back on. Oh no, that's no good. Yeah, so it's back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> So I've got my uh, uh, Lowell in here to help me make sure I can share my screen correctly. So yeah, let's see. Uh, background, I'm always like, oh, am I getting my screen shared right? But yeah. I don't know Welcome. I, I, I do share screen and then I hit that. Yeah, and you know, then you pick, it'll bring up a list of stuff you can share. And so then once you, um, you pull it up, you'll pick what you want to share. And is there any sound with your PowerPoint? Or, no, no okay, sound. Good, then you don't have to click that button. So that should be all, and then there'll be a stop sharing across the, at the top once it comes up. Okay, I just great. watched a video, so it must be true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Oh. Real quick if you want. I was going to say hello here. Okay. Somebody's telling us hello. Yeah. So I guess we're going to start. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, Hello, this is uh, Rula from Jordan Breast Cancer Program, a manager at the Service Delivery Quality Management Department. Uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, for uh, attending uh, the uh, uh, introduction series to our uh, um, uh, uh, pre-conference session for uh, the conference in uh, uh, 2022. Uh, Today's uh, webinar is about basic uh, MRI interpretation, uh, of course, uh, for the breast. Uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Pamela uh, Otto. Dr. Pamela um, is, um, um, sorry, Professor Pamela uh, is a chair uh, for the Department of Radiology at the University of Texas Health, uh, San Antonio. Uh, She she is a fellowship trained breast imager and uh, interventionist. Uh, For the past seven years, she served uh, as a chair of the Department of Radiology at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio, and she continues to to serve uh, patients in the Breast Health Center. She also serves as a a supervising radiologist for the University uh, Health System Breast Cancer Screening Program and uh, chair for the uh, Multidisciplinary Breast Tumor Board. Uh, Dr. Uh, Otto's research interests are within the area of breast cancer early detection. Um, uh, And she is here joining us today to enrich our uh, knowledge with uh, breast MRI. uh, And we are so happy to host her today. the floor is yours, Dr. Pamela. Uh, I just, I, I'd like to uh, uh, say a note before we start. Um, uh, if, uh, if the attendees have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to share them through the Q&A box or uh, through the chat, or you can raise your hand and answer your question uh, at the end of the webinar with uh, Dr. Pamela Otto. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Uh, Otto. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I was sharing earlier with Rula that uh, I had this horrible dream last night that I missed my lecture, that it was yesterday and I just missed it. It's like not showing up for your final. It was horrible, (laughs) but anyway, it's today and I'm back to normal. So I'm gonna go on and share my screen. Let's see, here we go. That's the one I want, yes. And I'll make it big. There we go. Does that look good, Dr. Rula? I guess so. All right. Sounds, it uh, looks great. It's obvious. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, anyway, uh, last time I spoke with you, I talked about the clinical indications for breast MRI. And then I had some feedback that really what you would like is some basics of breast MRI interpretation. So, that's what we're going to do today. Uh, Very basics with just some examples that I hope are helpful for you. 
I do need to thank my partners in breast imaging and intervention who helped me uh, have time to put the lecture together and also uh, gave me some cases. So the objectives of this presentation will be that you'll have a knowledge of a systematic and organized approach to the interpretation of breast MRI. You'll have a template for breast MRI reporting with everything on it that the American College of Radiology uh, recommends you have in your report, that you will know that specific, specific Suspicious, I'm sorry, I can't speak this morning. Suspicious morphologic findings always trump kinetic features. That the margins of the mass and the type of the initial increase in enhancement are two features that strongly predict the likelihood of malignancy. So that's what I'm hoping to go over uh, uh, in a case-based way. So first of all, let's just review a little bit about the sensitivity and specificity of MRI. Sensitivity is 77 to 91%. For MRI versus mammography at 32.6 to 50%. And specificity ranges from 81 to 97.2 for MRI versus 93 to 99% for mammography. So sensitivity is fabulous compared to mammography. Specificity is about the same. So as you may remember from my prior uh, talk, uh, there are clinical indications for screening of breast MR. Um, it's the American College of Radiology and the American College of, I mean, and the American uh, Cancer Society recommend that you divide ladies into three separate groups, high, intermediate, and low risk when you're deciding whether or not you should do a screening mammogram. High risk uh, would be, uh, they recommend annual screening MRI for high-risk patients, which would be greater than a 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer. If you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, if you have a first-degree relative with a known BRCA mutation, either 1 or 2, if you have a first-degree relative or relatives and carriers of the P10 or TP53 genetic mutations, like you see in La Ferrami, Cowden's, or BRR syndrome, and then, of course, patients that have re received radiation therapy to the chest between the ages of 10 and 30 years of age, you know, usually for Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is an example of a 22-year-old female with a family history of breast cancer and a mother diagnosed at age 26, a grandmother diagnosed at age 30, and ovarian cancer in maternal aunts and maternal cousins. So very high risk lady. So she went straight to MRI uh, because she's somewhat young to start uh, uh, mammograms. Uh, and she got this uh, MRI, which demonstrates a six millimeter circumscribed oval enhancing mass. And as you can see, there's fairly rapid uptake, not as much as we normally see, but fairly rapid. And then it continues to go up. So this is more of a benign curve. But we, because of her family history and the margins are a little bit lobulated, we went back and looked under ultrasound. And under ultrasound, you can see that it is a hypoechoic mass with irregular margins and a little bit of an echogenic halo here, which would make it suspicious. And this proved to be a seven by eight millimeter infiltrating lobular carcinoma. She didn't have any other findings in her breast. Uh, she decided to have a lumpectomy. She has gone on to have yearly uh, screening MRIs, and she's going to do that until she's no longer in her uh, childbearing years, and then plans to get a mastectomy bilaterally. Oops. So moderate to intermediate risk would be uh, women that have a lifetime risk of 15 to 20%. So those with a personal history of lobular carcinoma in situ, atypical lobular hyperplasia, atypical ductal hyperplasia, women with a personal history of breast cancer, which includes ductal carcinoma in situ, women with mammography dense breast are considered at moderate risk. So it's a little bit softer. I, I, uh, I always say it's, it's the women that have, have dense breast that are, uh, 
very hard to look at. So they seem, they're just not flowing. They're very hard to get a pattern out of. Then I'm going to uh, recommend that possibly they uh, have an MRI. And then it's recommended for the groups of women, uh, recommended that the women speak to the doctors about the benefits and limitations of supplemental MRI image uh, in addition to their mammography. So it's not just something we tell them, it's something we have a discussion about. So when I dictate the, this recommendation for moderate or intermediate, I always say, you know, the American Cancer Society guidelines state that this patient may benefit from screening MRI if clinically indicated to do so. So that leaves it very, very open for that referring physician and the patient to decide whether or not she wants to go to the extra screening of MRI. I'm looking here, I'm wondering if I have a question here. Oh, I'm going to get into how to differentiate foci from background parenchymal enhancement. Here we go. Okay, so low risk for breast cancer, annual screening mammography is not recommended for those that have less than a 15% chance of, of having breast cancer. Hmm. All right, so the calculation of risk, as you know, is uh, um, based on several different models. Uh, the Gale, which is primarily um, family history, the Claus and Tyro Cusick bring in uh, more risk factors, the density of your breast, if you've had atypical findings, how many biopsies you've had. So it just kind of depends which uh, calculation your group uses. Uh, we usually just go with the Gale model. Uh, if they're at higher risk, we certainly send them to a genetic counselor for uh, a better idea of what type of screening they would need. And then of course you have diagnostic MRI. So those that aren't just for screening, but those that are working up a problem. So we use those for newly diagnosed breast cancer patients. Those, of course, with infiltrating lobular cancers. And the reason for that is those can be difficult to visualize on mammograms. And because of their growth pattern, they grow along the normal architecture of the breast and can be very difficult to determine if you have one and determine the extent of disease. Also, they have a higher incidence of, of cancers elsewhere in the same breast or the other breast when compared to infiltrating ductal carcinoma. Certainly ladies who have a newly diagnosed breast cancer with dense breasts, that it's very difficult to get extent of disease. We use it to, in those patients for extent of disease and, some, and also in those patients that have DCIS that we're really trying to decide how much DCIS is there? Are they a lumpectomy or is it more extensive disease? And then of course, patients who have a positive lymph node with a negative mammogram. Now there is some controversy surrounding that. Some people say just uh, treat them with chemotherapy. Others say, no, we want to know where it is, or we're going to do a mastectomy. So I guess it kind of depends on your medical oncologist and surgical oncologist. But here, what we like to do is we do like to try to find the primary cancer within the breast. So those ladies with a positive lymph node and a negative mammogram will get a, a, a diagnostic MRI. So the things you need to know about your patient before you schedule them and when you schedule them is you need to know their clinical history. Have they had prior procedures? Did they have XRT, radiation therapy? Have they had any trauma to their breast? Uh, what are their symptoms? Do they have a palpable mass? Do they have pain? What about skin changes? We use vitamin E for our markers to mark all these places and our, our uh, technologists know to do that. Um, of course, when you schedule the patient, you want to schedule the patient between the seventh and 14th day of their cycle. If it's a screening examination uh, to decrease your background enhancement, uh, we do make exceptions for cancer patients. Sometimes we don't want to wait until that part of their menstrual cycle. So we may go on and schedule them, but if they're close, we'll schedule them between the seventh and 14th day. 
Certainly we need the patients to fill out a patient questionnaire because sometimes the clinical history we have does not match what really the patient is trying to tell us. And then of course, a safety questionnaire uh, for MRI safety. And all of this is provided to us uh, at the time of interpretation, the clinical history and the patient questionnaire is provided to us before we uh, see the patient just to make sure that, that MRI is the study they should be obtaining. Okay, uh, technical factors, uh, high field magnets. We find that a 1.5 to a three Tesla magnet is the best. You have to have slice thickness less than three millimeters, pixel resolution less than one millimeter. Your temporal resolution for kinetic evaluation, one to two minutes. Short acquisition times, one to two minutes. Uh, we give a contrast dose of 0.1 millimole per kilogram of gadolinium, followed by a flush, usually 20 to 30 cc's. We do continuous dynamic imaging for six to seven minutes. And of course we get fat suppression or subtraction sequences. We do use dedicated breast coils, and we like the breast coils where both breasts go in at once. I know they have some unilateral breast coils, but we just use the bilateral breast coil on all patients, whether they've had a mastectomy or not. Uh, certainly, an experienced, uh, detailed technologist is necessary because you need to get excellent patient positioning. Uh, you want the nipples pointing straight down. We do ours in the prone position. You get less breathing artifacts if you can do them prone. Uh, there's literature out there that says there's better positioning with arms at the side instead of above the head. We call above the head the Superman or Superwoman approach. Uh, if, if they have their hands above their head, they tend to tolerate it better than their arms at the side. Uh, so then you get into, is it, do I get less motion if I have their hands above their head or do I get better signal to noise if their hands are beside them? So you just need to play that in your own institution and see what works best. And then of course, mild compression is given by the, uh, the coil. You don't want tight compression or you're not going to get the, uh, enhancement that you want to see. Right, so our sequences are, we get a scout, non-contrast T1 weighted, non-contrast T2 weighted, gradient echo fat saturated, pre-contrast T1 weighted, gradient echo with fat saturation, contrast enhanced multi-phase T1 weighted, gradient echo fat saturated series. And then the gadolinium, like I said, is administered at 0.1 millimole per kilogram at two milliliters per second, followed by 20 to 30 milliliter saline flush. Our time intervals should be less than two minutes. We go out to six to seven minutes. And then we get subtracted post-contrast sequences from the T1 pre-contrast images and we use post-processing. Okay. So I think it's very important, especially in, in, in really not only in breast MRI, but in all your reports that you're systematic and organized so you don't forget anything, okay? So give the history, give the history, why am I doing this? You know, mother, sister, grandmother, and three aunts with breast cancer. Uh, uh, BRCA one or two positive. Um, infiltrating lobular carcinoma, dense breast. You know, whatever the history is, make sure you give a good history. In the States, I don't know how it is in Jordan, but in the States, if you do not give an adequate history, you will not be paid for the examination. Uh, insurance companies won't pay for it. And then of course, you wanna tell what your technique was. As with any medication you give, you need to dictate what contrast was injected and what type. Uh, you wanna give the amount of fibroglandular tissue and it's divided into four uh, quadrants, just like mammography is. You wanna give what is the background parenchymal enhancement, and it also is divided into four quadrants. The background parenchymal enhancement is, is important to say because the, if you have a lot of background parenchymal enhancement, the sensitivity of your MRI is going to go down. Of course, then you're gonna get the findings. 
and then an impression, and your impression is not a, a repeat of your findings. It's your final impression. And then of course you get bi-reds. Bi-reds are just like they are with mammography. So nothing there changes. So this is just a, our template. So we template in our top technology, all of our reports. So by templating it, we don't forget anything. And what we do is we tend to uh, default to what it normally is. So this is defaulted to a normal MRI of the breast. Uh, we can just say extra mammary tissues and then it'll highlight that whole area and then you just dictate what it is. Or if I say left breast, it's gonna highlight that whole thing and I can leave it like it is or I can dictate on top of it. So this makes it very easy that you don't forget anything and that everything is in your report that needs to be there. It's, and it's also great for education of your trainees. Okay, so findings. So I wanted to talk about focus and somebody asked a question about that. Focus was recently redefined in the ACR uh, BIRADS fifth edition compared to the fourth edition. The fourth edition said if it was less than five millimeters, that it was a focus. But now the MR lexicon defines a focus as a unique enhancing dot that is too small to characterize further morphologically as a mass or a non-mass enhancement. It's not a space occupying lesion. All right, so it's just one of those dots. I'll tell you, it's very difficult to evaluate things that are less than five millimeters, but I'm glad they got away from the five millimeters because sometimes you could, uh, you could see some morphology with it. Certainly just like mammography or ultrasound, you're going to describe your masses with shape, what is their margin, and, for MMR, and then for MRI, what is their internal enhancement? When they have mixed enhancement, you go with the worst enhancement profile, okay? So if it's got all three of them in there, go with the worst of it, okay? You can say mixed enhancement, but you're gonna come down solid on what is the worst part of it, okay? And then with non-mass-like enhancement, you wanna talk about the distribution of it. Is it segmental? Where is it? The location, all that. And then once again, the internal enhancement uh, patterns. Uh, you wanna discuss any significant skin lesions you see, if you see any intramammary, internal mammary or axillary lymph nodes that are abnormal. If there are any non-enhancing findings, you know, do you see some secretions in the duct? Do you see post-op changes, post-therapy changing changes, non-enhancing masses, architectural distortion, signal voids from your clip that you placed five years ago or the one you just placed in the cancer. Then again, associated features, uh, you know, do they have skin involvement? Is there nipple retraction? What does the axilla look like? Is there any invasion of the pectoralis muscle or the chest wall? And once again, architectural distortion. Is there distortion associated with that mass? Always give the depth and the location. So it's so easy to measure what is the depth and what is the o'clock. I like to say upper outer quadrant, right breast, 10 o'clock, five centimeters from the nipple. Very, very precise. And sometimes I even give, you know, what slice I see it best on. Uh, then you talk about the kinetic curve assessment. Is it the initial curve? Is it slow, medium, or fast? And then the delayed curve, is it persistent plateau or washout? And I'm gonna show some examples of that. Certainly, if they have implants, you wanna say what type is it? Where is it located? Retroglandular or subpectoralis? Any findings? Do they have any findings of rupture or does it look perfectly fine? Uh, you might want to say whether or not there's water droplets in it, and then certainly if there's peri-implant fluid or mass. So you, you all know this, BIRADS assessment categories. 
category zero, incomplete, needs additional imaging evaluation. Some people say you should not use this with MR uh, because you should be able to come down on something. Is it, is it a two, three, four, or five? The only reason I use zero is so that it marks it in our computer that I want that lady to come back for a second look ultrasound. What I really mean is it's a four and I dictate it as suspicious for malignancy, but I want her to come back to see if I can find it with ultrasound and not have to do an MRI guided biopsy. Uh, as you know, an MRI guided biopsy can take some time, takes up scanner time. And if you can do it uh, more easily with ultrasound, which you usually can uh, do it with ultrasound. So really that's the only reason I use a zero is for bookkeeping but they should either get negative benign, probably benign, suspicious, highly suggestive of malignancy or known biopsy proven malignancy. Those are the ones you should use because MRI is kind of like the terminal um, study that you're gonna get. Okay, I found this uh, image in the uh, clinical imaging for 2015. I had in my mind that I would try to make one of these myself, and then I found this image. So that's why you have this one, and I love it. Okay, so it kind of shows you pictorially how you call fibroglandular tissue and background enhancement. So at the top, they have, you know, the almost entirely fatty, scattered fibroglandular, heterogeneously dense, and then the extremely dense fibroglandular tissue. This gives you MRI breast density. So the fatty, scattered fibroglandular, heterogeneously dense, and extremely dense. And then when you get into MR background enhancement, you use minimal, mild, moderate, and marked. And once again, this is important because they have moderate or marked, you have decreased MR sensitivity because of all the background enhancement. So this would be minimal enhancement here. This is mild enhancement, just a little bit here, moderate and marked. And I've, I've actually made a big picture of this and hung it on the wall where we read our MRIs just as a reference for everybody to use. So we're using the same language. In mammography, I think it's important to use the same language. I can remember back in the day when we all had our descriptors and sometimes we had no idea what the other person was talking about. All right, so the kinetic curves. I, I know you've seen these. Uh, we talk about the initial upslope, uh, rapid upslope, medium upslope, slow if it's over 100%, it's continued rapid. And then you have your persistent plateau or washout. And here it is again. Type one has a rapid uptake and persistent. Type two is your rapid uptake and plateaus out. And three is rapid uptake and washout. And this is just a, an example down below of each one of them. This is your type one, your type two with a plateau and your type three. It's important to know that lack of enhancement has a high negative predictive value. So a negative predictive value of 88 to 96%. Um, the rapid enhancement with washout is your most characteristic of malignancy. So the type one curve has a malignancy rate of about 13%. Type two has a malignancy rate of about 20%. And type three has a malignancy rate of 46 to 70%, depending who you read. I got most of this information from Dr. Lehman's article in the AJR and Dr. Ashraf's in, um, oh, I didn't write down in what, but in 2021, he wrote an article. But I want, I want to impress upon you that morphology trumps enhancement every time. Okay, because you can have malignancies in a type one curve. So you really need to put both of them together. Is it, is it smooth with a benign 
enhancement curve, a type one enhancement curve, or is it very irregular with a type one enhancement curve? Uh, morphology will trump every single time. This is a 32 year old woman who came in with a palpable mass, mass in the left breast. It was biopsy proven invasive ductal carcinoma with extremely dense breast tissue. So uh, this is the palpable marker right here and right here. This is the mass, difficult to get extent of disease. We did do an ultrasound. You can see our biopsy needle going at it. Um, and then she got an MRI. So I'll give you a second. So you can decide what would you give this for fibroglandular tissue? I would give it a heterogeneously dense. On the mammogram, she looks extremely dense, but on the MR, I would give her a, a heterogeneously dense. And then background enhancements. What's she gonna give her? I would give her minimum background enhancement. Some might say moderate because of the things going on in the right, but minimum to moderate background enhancement. Okay, she had a type three curve. Uh, she has a very irregular mass with a satellite mass associated with it. For this lady, one of the most important things for her was, is my right breast okay? Uh, she's 32. She wasn't uh, really wanting to get a uh, mastectomy, but she wanted to make sure there was nothing in the right. So she, the right was negative. It's continued to stay negative. She had a partial mastectomy on the left after she got uh, neoadjuvant therapy, and she is doing well five years out. This is a 52 year old newly diagnosed left breast cancer with, a, I think most people would call this heterogeneously dense mammogram. You can see the mass by mammography here, very irregular. You can see the speculations coming out. Um, right breast was negative, it was dense, but it was negative. We wanted a better idea of extent of disease and she was trying to decide if she wanted a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, or if she wanted bilateral mastectomies. As you know, you've, um, you've dealt with these women. They can get very nervous and at some times are just like, take both my breasts off. I don't wanna worry about it. Uh, we know that morbidity and mortality, uh, bilateral mastectomies can be fairly high. Uh, so we recommend if at all possible, patients get a lumpectomy unless of course they're at high risk and they'll be counseled then about bilateral mastectomies. This lady had the known left breast cancer. She had no positive nodes, uh, no abnormal skin changes. Uh, upper, upper abdomen was negative, but she had an occult right breast cancer. So she decided to go on for uh, bilateral mastectomies with reconstruction. And I just want to convince you that it was an occult right breast cancer. I don't think you could really call anything here. There's our clip. Don't think you can call anything here. And there's our clip. MRI can be very helpful in extent of disease. This lady had known ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, it looked like it covered an area of about 1.7 centimeters, but she had fairly dense breast tissue. There it is again. You can just barely see the calcifications right in here. But when you get the MRI, we're gonna, well, I'll, I'll have you do the other exercise later. What you see is non-mass-like enhancement, and it covers an area of 4.3 centimeters, so much more extensive ductal carcinoma in situ than what was orig originally thought. So when you look at this, what you wanna say to yourself, what is the uh, density of the breast tissue? 
I gave it scattered fiber glandular and the enhancement. I gave it moderate. You might call it mild. I gave it a little bit more moderate based on all this stuff going on down here. All right, so I gave it moderate background enhancement. Once again, she had normal nodes. There's no involvement of the pectoralis muscle. Her internal mammary uh, lymph nodes looked normal. She had, she actually had a mastectomy because of the extent of her disease and the size of her breast tissue. She's doing well. Sometimes you get an MRI just to help you determine um, extent of disease and what's going to happen surgically. So this lady came in, she had a reconstruction after a mastectomy for breast cancer. And the question was, is there chest wall invasion? I mean, on the mammogram, you can see she's had the reconstruction, a deep flap reconstruction. Here, you know, we really couldn't pull in the pectoralis muscle. The, the mass felt fixed to some and didn't feel fixed to others. So we did an MRI. Well, first on the ultrasound, you can see it is a budding, that pectoralis, and you do wonder if it's going into the pectoralis, but the surgeon really wanted to know. So the MRI answers that question. You can see the reconstruction, all that going on. You can see the signal void from our clip when we biopsied it. And then other signal voids from her um, clips from prior surgery. But clearly you see invasion of the pectoralis muscle. Okay, so that was important for their surgical approach going in. We talked about associated findings. I think a very important associated finding to uh, dictate on is nipple retraction. Is there just nipple retraction or is there nipple extension? This is a lady, once again, very dense breast, invasive ductal carcinoma. You can see her very irregular enhancing mass. It was a type three enhancement. She had other masses within the breast. She had this one and this one and this one that on second look ultrasound we found. Um, but you can see that this is getting very, very close to the nipple. It's not necessarily going into the nipple, but it is causing nipple retraction. And you would want to be sure to put that into your dictation. And here's a different case with nipple extension. So this patient came in, she had a palpable mass. As you can see in here, the microcosmications you can see here. And then under ultrasound, you can see she had soft tissue within her duct. So she had soft tissue filling defects, hypoechoic filling defects within her duct. So the question is, do we need to take the nipple? So this MRI, I'll give you a second. What density do you wanna give it? I would give it scattered fibroglandular. Background enhancement, I would give it minimal. But what it does show is it does show that this mass extends straight into the nipple. Okay, so on this lady, she is going to have to have her nipple resected. This is her curve. So I'll give you a second. What type curve is it? It's a type three curve. She does have some washout going on. It doesn't go straight across. So she does have washout. And then of course, we all know you look for axillary lymph nodes. So this is a lady that unfortunate lady had a large cancer that she had uh, ignored for several years. You can see the signal void from our clip right in the middle of it. And then her axillary lymph nodes were very involved. You can see the thickened cortex was enhancing. This one, you don't really see a cortex. You, I mean, you don't really see any fat in it, but this one, you can see some fat in it, but very thickened cortex. So she had uh, positive lymph nodes, bulky positive lymph nodes. And if you kind of look at it here, you wonder if she's got extra capsular spread going on because that is irregular capsule right there. And you wanna look at your intermammary lymph nodes. Uh, I didn't have any abnormal lymph nodes, 
But this is, you know what the lymph nodes look like on mammogram. They always have a fatty hilum, ultrasound, your fatty hilum, thin cortex. Here it is on the T1 weighted. Here it is on the T2 weighted. And this is your contrast enhancement um, of your lymph nodes. Your lymph nodes should always enhance with contrast. One of the ways I, when I look at my uh, post-processing to see, did it post-process right? Does it have the color right? Did it subtract right? Is I find the lymph nodes. And if the lymph nodes are enhancing, then I'm confident that I have the right enhancement and I have the right post-processing that I can determine whether or not the mass I'm looking for is enhancing correctly. So just one of those internal checks you can do on yourself. You always wanna look for internal mammary lymph nodes. This is a normal internal mammary lymph node. Certainly this is an abnormal one, enlarged lymph node. Uh, the cortex is very thickened, it's, it's enhancing. And on PET-CT, once again, you see it right here. It's not often that we see enlarged internal mammary lymph nodes, and thus why I took these, these images from uh, the AJR and radiation oncology. Um, we haven't had a lot that had internal mammary lymph nodes. Then we talked about one of the reasons you would do a diagnostic MRI of the breast is if you had abnormal uh, lymph nodes that uh, were found to be uh, cancer. So this lady came in with palpable lymphadenopathy, just an image of it, uh, by ultrasound, hypoechoic um, mass, did a biopsy, it was invasive ductal carcinoma. The MRI showed an enhancing mass here, which was a little bit irregular, not a lot, but a little bit irregular right in here. You can see it right in here, just a little bit irregular. Uh, second look, ultrasound shows an irregular hypoechoic mass. Then we biopsied it, put a clip in it. Here's our ribbon clip, ribbon marker right here. And this was the cancer. I don't think anyone will fault us for not seeing that up straight, uh, upright. Uh, we did try to do a ultrasound before we sent her for the uh, MRI. Uh, the tech did not see that mass. Um, I didn't see that mass, maybe I was going too fast. Uh, seven millimeters and um, infiltrating uh, ductal carcinoma. Yes, infiltrating ductal. I'm going to show you a report next. I just wanted to show you a benign cyst. Um, so, of course, they're going to be bright on T2, ISO intense on T1. You do always want to, if they have cyst or whatever. Uh, normal or benign findings, you want to make sure that you put that into your report. So my next is a report that was done on this patient that had the benign cyst. Well, we start out her history. Uh, she was screening breast MRI. She was given a BIREDS 3 from the outside. We should have put on here that she's BRCA1 or 2 positive, which she was. Um, our technique say exactly what we gave as technique. We say we gave gadavist gadolinium. You wanna say which type of gadolinium you gave and how much. Then the background enhancement in the fibroglandular density. Right breast, there were some sub scattered subsonometer, T2 hyperintense, T1 hypointense lesions without enhancement, compatible with simple cyst. Uh, the same in the left breast. Then we talk about your excellent extra mammary tissues, so no significant abnormality in the image portions of the lower neck, chest, and upper abdomen. And then your impression, no MRI evidence of malignancy, come down on it. What is it exactly? Don't be a hedger. Um, and then the benign finding is simple benign bilateral breast cyst. Gets a category two. 
this is an unfortunate case, fortunate in the beginning and not so fortunate in the, in the end. This is a 50 year old female with a history, uh, family history of breast cancer and a mother and two sisters, all in their late thirties and early forties. Uh, she comes in, she has very dense breast tissue. Um, she just wanted to get a screening mammogram. I, I talked her into getting an MRI because of her history. She comes back and she's got a very, very bright, hyper intense, very well circumscribed mass. I was able to find it by ultrasound. It's right here. This is one of our, one of our newer ultrasound machines, but it was right here. I did a biopsy of it to see what it was. It came back as a fibroadenoma. I confirmed it by putting a clip in it and sending her back to MRI to make sure that the clip was there. Um, and then told her, you know, yes, this time there's nothing, uh, but she needs to get annual uh, screening MRIs of her breast. She refused uh, because, and I, I understand because she didn't want to live in fear of breast cancer just because her mother and two sisters had it. And she went on to have locally advanced uh, breast cancer bilaterally, caught somewhat late on mammography um, and now has had bilateral uh, mastectomies with reconstruction. She's doing well, but darn it. I wish we could have caught it early. This is a friend of mine that came in, 52 year old female with a concern for uplifting of her right nipple. Uh, I just wanna to pause to say if a patient says they have a finding, to me, they have a finding. That's it, okay? She was also concerned for a palpable mass uh, down in this area of her breast and the, the medial aspect of her breast, which by ultrasound was just a lipoma. Um, I looked at these and I really couldn't see anything. We did an ultrasound, couldn't see anything. When I looked at her nipple, I couldn't see anything. Uh, in retrospect, maybe I should have said something about that, but I didn't see anything in that area by uh, ultrasound. So we sent her for an MRI because if she says she's got uplifting of her breast, she's got uplifting of her breast. And I, I just couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, luckily her insurance company paid for it. And sure enough, there was her invasive lobular carcinoma right here. She had a little bit of a washout. So she did have washout. She had rapid uptake and some washout. This was an infiltrating lobular carcinoma. Um, I don't know about you, but when I see a mass sitting right on top of that implant, I always hope it's my partner that's got to do the biopsy. And with her, she let me know that, I mean, she's got saline implants, that she was going on a trip with her daughters to Disney World and I better not pop her implant before she went. So anyway, a little bit of stress there, but we got it, uh, we got it biopsied. When I do those, I just want you to know, I come in and I point up toward the skin. So I'll come in a little deep, know where my, nip, my needle is at all time and then point toward the skin. So if the worst thing that happens is my needle goes out of the skin, that's better than going into an implant. It's never happened, but I try to be very cautious with that. This was a 56 year old female who came in for screening mammography. These are her two view mammograms. Kind of wondered about this, about this, it looked new. We did tomo views of it, you see very well. This is an irregular mass with speculations. Ultrasound, so of course we biopsied it. Came back and as an enhancing mass, irregular margins, very irregular margins. And you can kind of see some speculations coming out from it. What would you give it for uh, breast density? I gave it a heterogeneously dense, primarily based on this stuff right here. You might go with scattered fibroglandular, but I went with this. And then for the background enhancement, I gave it minimal. She had no enhancing lymph nodes. These are normal lymph nodes here. 
She had no positive intramammary lymph nodes. Uh, I mean, internal mammary lymph nodes, everything looked good except for this, which is good for invasive lobular carcinoma. So she's going to have a lumpectomy and hopefully do very well. 52 year old female with recent diagnosis of Paget's disease. So she had skin changes. You can see the biopsy site, skin changes, uh, tape debris. All we really saw with a mammogram was some heterogeneous calcifications that actually don't look that bad, but they were new. And in the face of Paget's, uh, you're gonna take it a little more seriously. She had this hypoechoic mass uh, with irregular margins in the subareola region of the right breast. MRI showed, the main reason I'm showing this is to show you the nipple extension and skin extension that we saw right here. That was her pagets. You can see it in here. That mass did not enhance, which was good. And this was a normal internal mammary lymph node. All right, so if you're gonna talk about her breast density, I'll give you a second so you can say it to yourself. I gave it scattered fibroglandular, okay, for the enhancement. I gave it minimal. All right. So we'll shortly go through MRI evaluation of implants because that is one of the reasons that you do do uh, MRI of the breast. Uh, the signs of minimally collapsed intercapsular rupture include the following, linguini sign, teardrop sign, keyhole, or we used to say noose, but that is no longer acceptable, but some people still use it, so I put it in there, and then a subcapsular line sign. Collectively, these signs represent small amounts of silicone outside the implant shell, but contained within the fibrous capsule. The fibrous capsule is what your body forms around the foreign body of the implant. So it's broken through the capsule of the silicone, but it's contained within the body's fibrous capsule. I put radial folds in here because some people confuse radial folds with implant rupture. Radial folds will always go to the margin. All right, so you can follow them to the margin of the implant. Those are just infoldings of the capsule. Nothing to be alarmed about and not a sign of intercapsular rupture. The linguini sign, as you can tell, looks like noodles, right? So this is all the external capsule in here, but you can tell that there is no extra capsular or fibrous capsular uh, silicone. So this is an intercapsular rupture. This is the teardrop sign. See a little teardrop here, right? So that's, that's silicone inside here. And then she's got a little bit of an ex, extra capsular sign right here. And maybe right down here. Whoops, let me go back. And then the keyhole or new sign is right here. Just looks like a little keyhole right there and then a little bit of the linguini sign. Now compare it to this one. So this one's got linguini, uh, subcapsular sign, uh, keyhole sign, and silicone scattered throughout the breast, okay? So that's extra capsular rupture. It has ruptured outside the fibrous capsule of the uh, implant. On the left side, you just see the uh, keyhole sign and linguini sign, a little bit of linguini and some subcapsular uh, sign, but not extracapsular um, rupture. So recently, the FDA has started recommending that people with silicone breast implants receive MRI screening for silent rupture 
three years after the initial implant surgery and every two years after that. I think when we started putting in these uh, silicone implants, we didn't really think about the future. So, I mean, there are some ladies out there with a silicone implant that's like 40 years old. Uh, I, I, when I talk to my patients about them, I, I say, you know, they're kind of like tires. You know, after a certain number of years, you got to change those out. And, and certainly with the uh, newer implant, I mean, the older implants, they just weren't as durable as the implants they seem to be putting in these days. So, so when I start seeing patients with older implants, I will recommend in my report that they get a, a screening MRI to look for rupture. I'm sure you've seen or you've heard of what we call salad oil sign or water in the implant. So um, it's also called the droplet sign. It's characterized by small rounded high T2 signal foci within the implant. And it represents water droplets or small amounts of gas within the silicone. The imaging sign is not specific and should not be used alone to diagnose intracapsular rust rupture. So if you see these, sometimes, yes, you can see this water in there with a rupture, but it is, should not be taken as calling it a rupture if this is all you see. So this is all this lady had, no problem, no other signs of rupture, she was good. As I watched this go down, this actually came to the wall and is just a radial fold. And then lastly, now we have to start worrying about breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, been reading more and more about that. So when you start to see fluid or soft tissue around the implant, this must be high on your mind. So you can see the implant here and you can see the lymphoma right here. This is the lymphoma. So it's a new provisional category in the 2016 classification of lymphoid neoplasms. Its in incidence is rising owing to the increasing recognition of this complication. At a median of 10 years after implant insertion, the typical presenting features are sudden onset of breast swelling secondary to peri-implant effusion and less frequently mass forming disease. Histologic features comprise pleomorphic cells expressing CD30 and negative anaplastic lymphoma kinase receptor similar to systemic and cutaneous ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphomas. The infusion type, which is more common, is generally indolent and curable with surgery, which is good news. Unfortunately, however, the mass forming disease is more aggressive and systemic therapy is advocated. So in summary, I hope that you obtain a knowledge of a systematic and organized approach to the interpretation of breast MRI and to reporting breast MRI. I want you to really go away with suspicious morphologic findings will trump kinetic features every time. So it's just like everything else that seems in mammography you look at those morphologic findings first. Uh, if there's any irregularity, then suspicion goes up independent of other features. Uh, if you have the margins of the mass and, that are irregular and, and you have uh, rapid uptake in your enhancement, those features, those two features together strongly predict High, I would predict it should be high likelihood of malignancy, not heat likelihood of malignancy. So I'm gonna go and see if there are any questions. Okay, somebody asked, was biopsy done in the previous case? What case was that? Oh, of the non-mass-like enhancement. There was a biopsy done of the calcifications and we knew that it was ductal carcinoma in situ. We just didn't know. Um, you know, extent of disease because of the density of her breast tissue. Any other questions? We are opening the floor now for the questions. Please feel free to ask if you have any, any question about what Dr. Pamela. 
we have a question from Shayma, how to differentiate between peri-implant fluid collection and B-cell lymphoma by imaging? Um, well, what you wanna look for is their fluid around the implant. So if on T2 imaging, there's bright fluid around it, that would be an effusion. If, uh, uh, if it's an enhancing mass on, on T1 weighted post contrast, then, then you're going to worry more about a mass. So you have to look at the T2 and the post contrast T1 or the pre contrast T1. You know, what, what is the signal? What's the signal intensity? So T1 soft tissue, I mean, fluid is going to be uh, not bright. It's going to be iso intense with your breast tissue. On T2, it's fluid's going to be bright. Okay. On T1, if it enhances, it's probably not fluid. And so that's how you would determine that. We have um, another question from Basima. Do you see background enhancement in postmenopausal uh, women? Yes, you can see background enhancement. And sometimes it's surprising how much it can be. So I kind of wonder if her ovaries are doing a last burst of excitement and, and give some background enhancement. But yes, you can see it. Uh, I guess you answered uh, Harry's question. What is the signal intensity of papilloma? Um, oh, of a papilloma. Papillomas can look a lot like uh, a fibroadenoma, and they can they can enhance intensely sometimes. So almost like a you know a light bulb. So then what you're looking for is you know margins. Once again, you're looking at margins. We have another question. Is it mandatory to uh, do annual MRI screening in patients who underwent mastectomy with implant, or is it okay to do it alone uh, by ultrasound? Um, if a patient has had, okay, so it depends what you're screening for. So if you're screening for cancer in somebody post mastectomy, there is no screening. Okay, you don't need to screen for them. But if you're screening their implant and they got saline implants, then you would you would just follow the uh, the protocol of you know after they've been in for three to five years and then do it every two years to look for uh, silent rupture and that's if they had silicone implants. I mean certainly if they have saline implants, you're going to know when it ruptures pretty quick just with physical examination. So uh, but it's not it's not for cancer. It's for integrity of the implant. And we don't, we don't screen implants with ultrasound. That just is just, it's hairy. So we use MR for, for screening implants. Okay. So we have another question from Estra. Is there any role of uh, DWI sequences in breast legions? You know, I've, I've read some on it. We don't do it. We don't find it that helpful. Uh, but I know some people do find it helpful, but we, we didn't. We, we find the enhancement better. So we just do that. Okay, I guess uh, Heba um, um, is asking about breast implants. Is uh, MRI the only screening modality for CA or can we use other modalities? Okay, is breast implants MR the only screening modality for cancer? Um, I mean, you can still use uh, mammography for screening for cancer in patients with implants. I mean, just because they have an implant doesn't mean that they're at high risk, okay? So if you're screening for cancer, whether they have implants or don't have implants, uh, you may or may not need to do MRI to look for cancer. I mean, it, just, it really just depends on their uh, risk factors. So you treat them the same. The only reason you would do uh, the, the, the MRI is if you were going to be screening for silent rupture. Okay, so uh, um, someone is asking about how, you uh, how do you decide which risk model to use for high risk patients? I think uh, generally speaking, the family history gives you your most information, right? So first degree family, a uh, member with premenopausal uh, breast cancer. And I really, I hesitate with the premenopausal and postmenopausal. I like to go, you know, if, if, if they had it before age 45, before age 50, 
you know, because when do people go through menopause? You really don't know, right? Uh, it's a perimenopausal thing. So I go more with age. So if they had early age of breast cancer, certainly if they're under 40, uh, if they're in their forties, I start thinking about it and I might go, go from Gale model, maybe up to one of the two other models. When it gets up, when it gets confusing like that, I personally, generally send them to a genetic counselor. Somebody that's got the time to sit down with them and go through their whole family tree, go through all the different things they're going to look at instead of just family history. I, uh, I, don't, um, I don't interview all of my screening patients, right? Uh, I just see their images. So if I get a little bit of a history about family history and if it's starting to look uh, suspicious or high enough, then I just put in my report you know, recommend consideration of genetic counseling. And then I give them the number because it's 450-GENE, G-E-N-E. So that makes it so easy. Actually, uh, I just want to barge in here and uh, talk about the genetic counseling. Um, uh, it's, um, it's a new field here in Jordan and it started only in K King Hussein Cancer uh, Center so far. So we have uh, uh, the tests uh, and the uh, laboratories. However, we still don't have the genetic counselors who are, who are well experienced in this field. So it could be an issue here uh, in regards of genetic counseling when it comes to risk calculation. However, we were the ones who first talked about it as Jordan Breast Cancer Program when we adopted the NCCN guideline, gu guidelines uh, which including, uh, included talking about uh, genetic counseling and risk assessment through uh, um, um, uh, talking about the clinical encounter. The CBA uh, is not enough alone. We need to have the uh, genetic uh, counseling along with it. However, uh, again, with the risk assessment, since we don't have uh, a widespread uh, of uh, this specialty, health specialty, the genetic counseling. What is the other option for us to, to take for risk assessment? I would say you can, uh, you can pull up all three risk assessments on the internet, right? And if you yes. have the ladies fill out, you know, before they see you, fill out a piece of paper that says, you know, what their risks are. So you list all the risks that would go with different things. Have they had atypical ductal hyperplasia? Have they had multiple biopsies? Family history, certainly. What, you know, have they, do they have a family history of colon cancer? Do they have a family history of ovarian? You know, and really go through it. And then you could go in the computer program and just put those things in, whichever one you want to put them in. And, uh, and then you could come up with what their risk is. And uh, it's funny how much just atypical ductal hyperplasia will increase your risk. Um, so, and it, it, you put that on top of a family history, now you're probably, you know, needing annual MRIs. So you can pull those things up on the internet. And, and I think some of them you can get like an institutional license so that they'll like, you can put all the patient information in and it can print it out. And I'm not saying you do it as a physician. Of course, you would have a front desk person take that information from the patient, put it into the computer and hand yeah. you some information. It's, it's doable, you know. Yeah. It is doable and, and some mm -hmm. places do that. Yes. So we have another question from Dr. Mahasan Najjar. How do you evaluate uh, MRI after new adjuvant chemotherapy? Do you try to use a uh, risk uh, uh, criteria? Do you know what? Um, MRI after neoadjuvant right now, unless they're on a study, of course, but if it's just uh, did the tumor shrink and how did the tumor shrink, we don't use recess because it's not really... Resist is really for research, uh, not so much for does it look like, like they've um, responded to the chemotherapy and how much surgery are they going to need post chemotherapy. So, you know, masses sometimes with chemotherapy, they just shrink away or they just shrink smaller. Some masses, however, you get a little bit left here, a little bit left here. And then they're no longer a lumpectomy candidate. So we use MR to help guide us on whether or not they're lumpectomy candidates or do they still need to have a mastectomy. 
recessed from from what we use it for is 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 for phase one and phase two trials um looking at the response and you would do it more than one you would do it during their therapy you know after each um after each therapy you would then do a recess read and it, it's more of a research tool so no we don't Okay, what is uh, your uh, opinion on abbreviated MRI for screening? My opinion is it should be used more. That's my opinion. My partners do not agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, he and, asked for your opinion. So, <laughs> yes. so uh, uh, there's four of us and I got, uh, I got uh, uh, voted down. So we don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> That's your opinion. So we have another question from uh, Siham Abadi. Is it possible for an injury to turn into a tumor? And what is the percentage for that? Uh, no, it's, it's not felt that trauma causes um, breast cancers. You know, not like continued trauma to your skin. You might get a squamous cell carcinoma. Or, or trauma of smoking is going to give you a tongue cancer or whatever. It, it's not felt like it works like that. So um, generally what we see is a lady will have trauma maybe to her from a car wreck. You know, the seatbelt hits her and now she's got a big hematoma or she has pain from it. And that's the first time she's actually felt her breast. Okay. So that's when she feels her mass. Okay. They're usually not related. Certainly you can have palpable hematomas, which you just follow up or whatever. Uh, but it's not felt to be like some other cancers where continual trauma or, or trauma might cause some. So no, it's not trauma related. So uh, another question from uh, Omni Afifi. For high risk patient of breast cancer with positive feminine history. Sorry. If the initial MRI is negative after who, uh, how much time do you recommend follow up uh, MRI? One year. One year. One year. And what we generally do is we get their mammogram and then six months later we get their MRI and six months later they come for their mammogram and then they come for their MRI. So they're seen every six months, but they get annual mammograms and annual MRIs. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Now, one thing you might want to think about is patients getting MRI, even high-risk patients, it's hard to convince them to get an MRI because it's usually not right there in your clinic. So up to 50% of women who it's recommended they get an MRI just won't go to the trouble. So in those patients, and if you know about those patients, I send them for, for whole breast ultrasound. And we'll, if they won't get an MRI, I'm gonna send them for a whole breast ultrasound if they're dense breasted. If they're heterogeneously dense or extremely dense, they just go immediately over and get an ultrasound, whole breast ultrasound, because I can't get them to get an MRI. Sounds so a little, little maternalistic, probably not appropriate. <laughs> No, uh, I felt that uh, it is a you know a bit specific. You know, each um, each, um, each case is different, totally different from the other. Right. Yes. So I guess um, uh, we don't have any more questions. Actually, I would like to thank you, Dr. Pamela. This was very insightful, and I would like to thank you for one more thing. More thing, you know, you know the stories of your uh, patients. And you know, they are not just numbers, they are not just images, they are stories, they are they having families. So, uh, and that's what we at Jordan Breast Cancer Program keep advocating for. And we're happy to see uh, someone uh, uh, in the health, healthcare field, uh, uh, like uh, your respect itself as, um, as considering this um, uh, during the lectures. I, yeah, I would really uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, we have one more question. Can we take it? <laughs> okay. What if a patient has unilateral cancer and underwent mastectomy with implant, then came next year for breast cancer screening mammogram? Is it recommended to do an MRI as she has an implant or mammogram and ultrasound are enough for screening? It would depend. 
it would depend on how how high a risk was she was she you know was she at the high risk or she at intermediate risk okay so if she's at intermediate risk then that's a conversation you have with her if she's at and just because you had cancer doesn't mean you're at high risk okay that puts you just that alone puts you at intermediate risk so if they are not at high risk they would get a uh, just a, a mammogram and uh, now if they're very dense breasted they're going to get an ultrasound with me it just depends on every patient um, and then after a certain amount of time the fda is recommending screen those uh implants for silent rupture um I haven't seen that done routinely yet, but I, that FDA recommendation just came out. So, so uh, we'll see you. We'll see you next year to talk even more about MRI and uh, have hands-on cases to discuss. Uh, please, uh, I would uh, allow me to thank you for for this uh, uh, insightful uh, lecture on behalf uh, on behalf of JBCP team and the attendees um i was very happy to uh, to mo um, you know, moderate this uh, uh, this uh, beautiful lecture and hopefully we'll see you next year dr uh, professor otto thank you it's such a pleasure thank you very much thank, thank, take you. Care. thank you uh take care you too thank you <laughs> thank you